On a damp spring evening in 1988, Norway's remote coast lay wrapped in low cloud and drizzle. High overhead, four turboprop engines hummed through the cloud. The aircraft was Vidura Flight 710, a Dash 7 making its second hop of the day. In just eight nautical miles, the crew expected to break through the cloud, spot the runway lights, and land safely on the runway. Instead, 36 souls would vanish into a mountain named Torgatan. The impact would be heard for miles, the flames visible briefly through the gaps in the fog, then the night would swallow the evidence, leaving only questions. Stay tuned to find out what happened in this extraordinary flight. Just before we begin, I want to thank Gun H74 for the suggestion of this incident. If you have an incident or accident you would like to see featured on this channel, comment down below. The aim is to cover incidents that people haven't seen multiple times and hopefully provides unknown incidents for us to see. Also, please bear with me on the pronunciations of many of these Norwegian towns and airports. As always, I research the correct way to say them and hope to get it right, but inevitably some won't be perfect, so I apologise in advance, especially to any Norwegian people that I may offend. Long before cockpit doors were reinforced and sterile cockpit rules enshrined, Norway's regional pilots crisscrossed fjords and island chains on what they called Melkafli, or milk runs. These routes stopped at every town with a strip of asphalt. The work demanded grit and improvisation. In 1985, Vidra introduced the larger de Havilland Canada Dash 7, a 49-seat, four-engine, short takeoff airliner that promised more capacity and quieter cabins. What it also required was stricter discipline, absolute adherence to instrument procedures, meticulous cross-checking, and a cockpit immune to distraction. On the 6th of May 1988, that culture shift was still underway when Flight 710 left Trondheim 90 minutes late, carrying families, business travellers and a handful of off-duty airline staff north towards Buda, with three en-route stops. They would never reach the second. Flight 710 departed Trondheim at 19.23 local. There was a 90-minute delay due to issues with a different aircraft preventing the release of Flight 710. Their planned route took them from Trondheim to Buda Airport, with stops at Namsos Airport, Brnoisond Airport and Janescheyen Airport in Stocker. At the time of the trip, there were 52 people on board. This was a busy flight, but with each stop the numbers would reduce. Fiedera, founded in 1934, had earned a reputation as Norway's aerial postman, ferrying letters and babies, doctors and food crates through winter gales that kept ferries at harbour. Its crews were proud improvisers. If the weather closed in, they ducked under the cloud, lined up with a familiar mountain ridge, and touched down on tiny runways wedged between sea and mountain ranges. The new Dash 7s, however, came with more modern, improved cockpits and stricter limitations. The aircraft in today's incident, Lima November Whiskey Foxtrot November, was eight years old with 16,000 flight hours. The aircraft had passed an inspection three weeks earlier and carried no known defects. The Pratt & Whitney engines were healthy, the avionics freshly calibrated and the cabin secure. For the crew, the captain was 58 years old, with just under 20,000 flying hours, nearly 3,000 of them on the Dash 7. He had returned from a six-week holiday only days before. Beside him was the first officer, 31 years old, with 6,500 hours in his logbook, but fewer than 90 on the Dash 7 as he previously flew Vidura's of smaller twin otters. A solitary flight attendant worked in the cabin. Because every seat was taken on the evening's first leg, a paying passenger had been invited to occupy the cockpit jump seat. Common practice at the time, yet this decision would prove to have a negative impact on the flight ahead. The first sector from Trondheim to Namsos lasted barely 20 minutes. The Dash 7 touched down smoothly and 16 of the 49 passengers departed the aircraft. Empty seats appeared in the cabin, but the jump seat visitor chose to remain up front. At 20.07 local time, Flight 710 lifted off again. It swung northwest over darkening fjords and requested to climb to flight level 90. At 20.13 local time, 
they receive permission from Trondheim Air Traffic Control Center to climb to flight level 90. Inside the cockpit, the scene was relaxed. The captain was in command, the first officer handling radios, and an inquisitive passenger was asking questions about torque settings and fuel burn. The first officer focused on radios and rarely got involved with the conversations with the passenger, but the captain was happy to provide the answers. The cruise for this leg was barely 15 minutes, hardly enough time to prepare for descent. At 2016 local, the first officer used a secondary radio to speak with company operations, informing them that they were due to arrive at 2332. This was in 16 minutes time. The jump seat passenger kept chatting, with time to their destination becoming ever closer. Under modern sterile cockpit etiquette, both conversations would have waited. Although the rule for a sterile cockpit for critical phases of flight was already introduced in 1981, there was a relaxed view of this rule across the world and within different airlines. This rule was introduced to prevent distractions during critical phases of flight, such as taxi, takeoff and landing, with some airlines implementing the rule below 18,000 feet with others from the pre-descent checks. At 2020 local, the crew informed air traffic control that they would start their descent and requested a change to Brunoisond Aerodrome Flight Information Service. At 2022 local, they spoke with the controller and informed them that they were 25 nautical miles from the airport at flight level 80. The controller reported that there was no other aircraft in the area, runway 22 was in use, the wind was at five knots from the southeast, visibility was five nautical miles, and there were light showers. The first officer then spoke with company operations again and requested a taxi be ordered for one of the passengers who was potentially going to miss a connected ferry. This conversation lasted 62 seconds. The captain then started to discuss the descent. At 2024 local, he asked for the descent checklist and the fastened seatbelt signs were switched on. In the flight deck, he then announced that they were going to descend to 1,500 feet over Torquaton, then step down to 550 feet and break right to land on runway 22. Torgatan, however, was not an official fix. The published profile required the aircraft to hold 2,460 feet until it reached a beacon called Lecan, then descend in stages. The captain's local shortcut relied on visual cues, cues that would not exist in cloud. Seconds after 2027 local, the altimeter passed 1,600 feet, already 400 feet below the charted altitude. The captain called for the gear down and initial flaps. The Dash 7's nose rose slightly as drag bled off speed, then eased downward. Neither pilots called out their deviation and no one cross-checked distance against altitude. The landing gear was confirmed down and locked and at this point the passenger in the jump seat started to ask about the reserve systems should the landing gear not deploy properly. The aircraft continued to descend to 550 feet. The autopilot leveled the aircraft at 560 feet. Eight nautical miles still separated the aircraft from the runway threshold, yet only 560 feet of sky remained between them and the ground. Air traffic control then asked for their position, with the first officer responding with eight miles. In that instant, the gulf between perception and reality locked into place. If the aircraft were truly eight miles out, 1,500 feet would be appropriate, but the altimeter read 560. The controller passed a wind update and the first officer thanked him and they continued their approach. In the cabin, seat backs snapped upright and tray tables were locked. Everything appeared normal. The view was obscured out the window with the expectation to break through the cloud and to start to see the ground at any moment. At 2028 local, the jump seat passenger resumed small talk with the captain. He responded politely, then commanded, flaps 25, props fully fine. The first officer moved the levers. At 2029 local, the pre-landing checklist was completed. A few seconds later, the ground proximity warning system sensed terrain and issued a sharp monotone minimum. In the same second, the four engines surged. The nose pitched six degrees upwards. The mountain's black wall emerged from the cloud. There was nothing that could be done. The aircraft was too low and the distance too short. And at 20.29 and 30 seconds, the Dash 7 struck the mountain, the right wing tick first, followed by the rest of the aircraft. In that moment, 36 people lost their lives. 
Shortly after the crash, an emergency was called. Fire trucks rolled out and blue lights flickered across the sodden fields. A Royal Norwegian Air Force Sea King was launched, but downdraft and low cloud ceilings forced it to orbit until dawn. Volunteer rescuers slogged up narrow trails to find the wreckage, and near midnight they reached the crash site. At 23.30 local, authorities declared that there were no survivors. By dawn, Torkatten stood covered in fog, but clearly scarred by a black streak of soot. 75 Home Guard soldiers established a perimeter, while investigators from the Accident Investigation Board in Norway set up a forward lab in the airport's hangar. Both black boxes were miraculously intact and on their way to Farnborough for analysis. Early data told a blunt story. The Dash 7 had been fully controllable, engines producing power until impact, and the autopilots remained engaged, obeying altitude commands dialed by the crew. The aircraft had flown exactly where it was told, straight into the rising terrain. Why had two qualified pilots left safe altitude four miles early? The descent from 1,600 feet should have started four miles from the runway, but in this instance, they began their descent at eight miles from the runway. Interviews with Vidura crew revealed a culture of informal shortcuts, cockpit visitors, and radio chatter through approaches. Training records showed that Dash 7 conversions took place without simulator time. Pilots practiced instrument descents only in the real aircraft and often in daylight. Approach charts carried out-of-date beacons and lacked clear vertical profile drawings. Mutual monitoring between captain and first officer, call and response attitude checks were more aspirational than routine. The commission found several errors on Vidura's maps, which could have influenced the accident. A closed marker beacon was still on the maps. A vertical flight plan from Lecan was not included. The height limitations in the accident area were noted through comments rather than through a graphical presentation and confusion as to when the timing of the final approach should start. The commission also criticised the airline for its checklists, instructing the pilots to tune one of the radio channels to the company frequency during descent, at a time when non-safety related communication is unwanted. The commission could not pinpoint the moment of misjudgment, but it traced a web of contributing threads, distraction, complacency, ambiguous documentation and organisational drift. Its final report, released in August 1989, names the cause as premature descent for reasons unknown, and recommended sweeping changes, enforcing sterile cockpit rules, correct charts, raising minimum altitudes near Torgatan, invested in simulator training, and embedded crew resource management in every flight. Flight 710 was the second of four fatal Vidura accidents between 1982 and 1993 each pressing the airline closer to modern safety management. By the mid-90s, Vidura had installed full motion simulators for Dash class aircraft, mandated sterile cockpit protocols, and embedded crew resource management in every recurrent course. Brunoisund Airport later received a satellite-based landing system that provides pilots with vertical guidance to the runway, technology that would almost certainly have prevented the 1988 tragedy. Today, hikers climb to Gatton's famous tunnel, pausing at a modest plaque engraved with 36 names. Each May, families gather for a quiet ceremony, joined by Vidura crews who never met the victims yet carry the lessons on every approach. On the crash's 25th anniversary, a retired police officer reminded investigators that the jump seat passenger had carried a brick-sized mobile phone, with its 15-watt transmitter buzzing away. Could electromagnetic interference have fooled navigation receivers? Engineers then tested Dash 7 avionics under worst case conditions and found no measurable effect. It was determined that human factors, not radio waves, had lured Flight 710 below safety altitude early. In aviation history, the margin between routine and catastrophe is often measured in seconds and in feet. Vidura Flight 710 reminds us that experience can foster overconfidence, that a single unchecked assumption can override layers of technology, and that distraction, however friendly, can be fatal. It is unknown why the crew descended eight miles from the runway rather than the published four miles. In that moment, I believe it was a simple oversight that should have and could have been caught by either pilot and or air traffic control, but because of the relaxed safety culture, 
simple clarity checks were missed. It's incidents like this that make aviation safer today than ever before. Unfortunately, some lessons are learnt through disaster, but it ensures that they are not repeated in the future. It is definitely a lesson that I will be taking forward with me, and I'm sure many others too. Please like the video if you found it interesting, and consider subscribing for more videos like this one. Thank you for watching.